that quote about women being scaled down men was actually, <laughs> you know, we were sent into combat with armor vests that would not have kept us alive because right. they failed to account for boobs. It doesn't freaking fit. <laughs> Good example of people's like what people think of as casual sexism or not that bad. Or, you know, you are an intelligence officer. Why did it matter if you couldn't be in combat? Like, mm. well, because I was sent into combat with zero combat training and right. armor that didn't work because of my gender. <sighs> Some things get lost in translation and transition. Off topic, your TED talk was great. Uh, lost in transition. Nice. Wow. It was well done. Yeah. So another insight for me, like I was saying, regular folks who aren't exposed to uh, military, you cover briefly the, the whole proxy aspect of war that um, contractors participate with military in the war and they don't have to follow like any of the uh, protocol that a military would have to do. Yes. Because essentially like when you're in the, the embrace of the military, you fall under military law, right? Mm -hmm. So if I were to murder somebody dur during my six and a half years in the military, right. I would be in military jail for the rest of my life, not right. in a civilian jail. Mm -hmm. But that becomes very problematic, with, especially when you look at the sexual assaults that go on. Just You bet. I mean, every woman is scared. There's parts of the base they literally call Rape Alley. We're all told to hold our weapons at the ready when we're walking home at night. And if you ask your boss what they think that does to your mental state, of course, you know, if a contractor, like, assaults someone, there's just nowhere to get justice. We already lose hope of getting justice when another soldier assaults us, especially a contractor from another country, right? Because mm. in yeah. Afghanistan, the combat in Afghanistan was a coalition of 66 nations. So, for example, my, my contractor story, and Uncultured, you know, he's a former U.S. Marines, but he's with the Canadian. So you weren't able to get any action on what you experienced? So, I mean, in, in my case specifically, um, I didn't even try, right? Got because yeah. I, again, like, you know, there's sort of this complicated setup, and I explain it in the book. The military has this law essentially banning sex when you're deployed, under right. their good order and discipline, um, I have this theory that anytime you try to legislate sex in an organization, it's very, very problematic. In my experience in the military, what I lived through was like, they didn't demonize the sex, they or make the sex taboo, they made having a vagina taboo, right? So you're watched yes. everywhere you go, you're alone. In my case, you know, I'm essentially assaulted in a date rape fashion and I'm right. somewhere where I'm not supposed to be. And people now will even act horrified by that, but anyone honest will be like, yep, in 2011, if you were a mm -hmm. lieutenant that got yourself raped because you were off with a guy alone, mm -hmm. That would not end well for your career. Like, not only would you not get supported, but you would get shown the door of your career. You know, it was so awful because I had always told myself, right, if this ever happens to me again, I'm going to fight back. I'm going to report. Like, I'm not going to be one of those women. And not only do I not report it, right, but I'm, I'm armed in that scene and he isn't. You know, I'm really trying to show i think that how complicated the dynamics are of the the warning that gets issued to the women of like oh just don't get raped yeah just hey please, don't please get raped deploy. yeah please go deploy go live in it that's a t-shirt i think Horrible. don't get raped that's a t-shirt maybe, 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 maybe i'll add that one to my website get your merch together <laughs> no okay but seriously i'm sorry we we gotta laugh at this pain sometimes but but Daniela, my heart goes out to you that, you know, I also have experienced date rape after slavery, sex slavery. It's like, you know, we're, to be very honest, men know when they smell an injured woman. And right, so we need attention too, you know? 
Yeah, the statistic I've heard is that 83% of adult assault victims were also assaulted as children. I'm now into writing the second memoir, and it's even more apparent. You know, every time I write about my early life and all of these sort of like dangerous situations I was putting myself in. Right. But you, it is exactly what we were programmed to do. So do you think that because we our trauma was so normalized during the early years, that's why we put ourselves in dangerous situations? It's like, oh, well, this feels familiar. Part of it, too, is I think that we just were lonely, right? When you leave yeah. your group. You yeah. lose all your camaraderie. You're so That's alone. Right. That's and right. I always say, you know, because I'm this white blonde girl that grew up in Latin America in a cult, right? Nobody yeah. ever stereotypes me correctly, <laughs> except for predators. In high school by myself, yeah. you see a 16-year-old walking home under a freeway at night with a fast food uniform. That teenager doesn't really have parents Back that up. are out protecting her. Right. And even so. even when you describe sitting in the classroom and your first husband walks in and zeroes in on you and walks right over, it's like, God damn, the homing beacon for these predators, they smell vulnerability. And for our part, I think like we are looking for somebody to teach us about the world and to take yeah. care of us and to true. sort of be that, you know, I get very lucky because I meet this girl, Danielle, on my first day of basic training, yeah. she becomes my guide, but she's right. not a, a toxic person, right? Whereas my first husband, I mm-hmm. latch onto him kind of for the same reason, right? I tell my backstory, like I need a guide but he is a very toxic person. The Frankie Files. Cults, Mind Control, and Sexuality in Society by Frankie Tees. And it was so ironic when you met Danielle, not Daniela. Parents were intense missionaries, and I have a lot of siblings. And she goes, wait, was it Children of God? My blood just turned to ice. I can't even imagine, because my cold is so small, no one's ever done that to me. Yeah, it's, it has happened to me twice now, like before I started talking about it. And it was very strange both times. But right. then the thing that became very nice, right, was this this thing that we don't realize that as cult survivors, especially when we're not open about our past. And I mentioned earlier, like, you just don't know basic things. And I there's know. no explanation for it. <laughs> yeah, we um, skipped that I, whole indoctrination yeah, part exactly i i joke about it now like my husband my amazing husband is retired after 20 years in the army and mm-hmm. imagine if he just tried to pretend that those 20 years didn't exist right? exactly he just tried to pre- present himself to the world your whole backstory right like it pretty just much makes sense and so, people know that yeah yes and so but when you're closeted yeah. like people know it doesn't make sense but they don't yep. know why they don't know why you're lying. It's why true. Shifty. And, and, and we we are covering up for our abusers. That's the sick and sad part. It's like holding exactly. a secret. It, it's like I finally went, wait a minute, I'm not lying for my abusers anymore. And I had a moment like you did in the guard town. And, yeah. and I was like in 2014 when I decided to speak out, which was the first time I ever decided to do so, I told my mom a lot of stuff. And... I had never told her that happened to me. She was shocked. And I really felt a crisis of faith. Like maybe this life is not worth living, you know? And, and I remember like you, you wait a minute, if I do this, they will win. That ain't going to happen. They already, I'm not keeping their secrets any, any longer. It's over. And it is a moment. It is a moment. And I, you know, I think one of the things that's so interesting when we, because there's always this split, right, with trauma survivors, the ones who want to talk about it and the ones who don't. Right. And they they say, they're like, oh, I just want to get over it. It is true that once you acknowledge it and once you start talking about it, like, it, it takes over a bit because there's so much. You have so much to contextualize, right? And I give this this analogy in Uncultured of having like a lockbox in my head where I put all the things I don't want to mm. deal with. But then yes. when you open it up, like Pandora's box, right? And, and you're really going to have to start dealing with all of these things. But I also yeah. think 
it like it's exhausting, it's terrifying, but it becomes a beautiful thing later on because that's yes. when you get to post traumatic growth. And that's when you get to, mm-hmm. you know, like in the end of uncultured where I'm sitting on my deck in fake Brazil, you know, and I've I've built this sort of mm-hmm. beautiful world for myself with all of the crazy cult baby things I was exposed to that were good. You know, and and when I yeah got to sort through my life very deliberately, I got to keep the things that I got that are good, right? And and bring those into my life. For example, raising my own daughter to be trilingual. And it, it is that very same thing, right? It's like, I told all my own stories, so nobody has power over me anymore. I, w- I would like to put a big highlighter on that. That, you know, once I decided to speak out, they can't, make me look crazy so I won't speak out. None of that. It's out now. I have the power. I'm taking it back. Exactly. And we took our yeah. power back. And so, we and took it back. else you said, Frankie, that's so important, right? Because I've spent, about your mother, right? I've spent a Big decade topic. having conversations with my mother. But still, right. when she read my book, was some of the first times she realized the extent of the abuse that I've gone through. Because she, she had thought she protected me. But what I think is so important about that was that I, in my subconscious, as a five or six year old child, I thought she knew, yes. right? Especially because my mom had grown up in it too. So I thought, you know, this person who loves me and wants to protect yep. me, accept these things, right? And it, it so yep. I think like that's an important part of healing for cult survivors specifically is and a, you're locked in a system uh, yes and, and a lot of times your own parents didn't know what was going on but as children we don't absolutely understand that and um true i did this uh intro to adult children of cults episode four i think and i was reading this article um by a family therapist named in the broadcast i don't want to mispronounce his name he says that often we protect our parents. We were parented so early. We protect them and shield them from knowing all the details. Yep. What a strange freaking thing when they are the ones who enabled us to be exposed in the first place. It's like, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a syndrome. So the moment we confront our parents is definitely a growing moment. Yes. And even, and it took a while. Even for me with my process of excommunication, like I was, I wanted to leave. I couldn't break my parents' hearts and tell them that, right? So I'm still Understood. trying to protect them. And then finally right. I realized like, no, you just have to break the biggest rule there is so that they want to get rid of. But it really was this, right? Like when my stepfather walks in the room and yells at me that I am a slut, <laughs> I can then yell Ugh. back, I want to leave the family, right? Whereas... Yes. Before that, I was still trying to protect my mom and my dad from knowing that I'm this evil backslider that doesn't care about their religion, knowing that their brothers have been hurting me and doing this stuff for me for all these years. Right, right. The irony of a sexually abused person being called a slut. Wow. You mean an indentured sex slave? Is that what you meant to say? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, let's get into this. Um Children of God, Family International, you were born into in the 80s. Your mother merely age 14 when she had you. The dynamics of your family are sprawling, even though you explained them very well in the book. I couldn't still get my mind around it. How many siblings do you have? Who is your father? And how are you related to the clergy in this cult? Yes, so... We'll just start back with, so David Berg, this random guy who decides to start the cult. Um, 70s? In, the, in 1968. Um, 68 in the California? In California, yes. And okay. probably about Thank two you. years later, they get to Texas. They've brought pretty much the whole group there. And my great-grandmother ends up donating property to him, his first property. Um, Mm. and it's as her daughter goes off to join these children of God, Jesus people. And she's kind of so happy to have her troubled daughter removed that she (laughs) rich, rich Dallas lady gives them a house. My grandfather, like they were already together when they joined the cult. My grandfather brought 
my grandmother into the cult and then my great grandmother donated mm-hmm. land. And then Got it. my mother was born. And then mm-hmm. when she was 14, her dad, who was one of the, one of the two men running the finance for the whole 10,000 people organization at this point. Right. And right. the close to the leader. Yeah. And so the other man running the finance who happened to be older than my grandfather was the one that then impregnated my mom during one of her uncle's sessions. Yes. Uh, yes. During a session when she was sent to his bed. Um, and then, but so then, so, it's so like, through my biological father, or I will say I have 25 siblings that I know of. And it, that's through, you know, what I like to call cult math, which is like my mom and the three, my, cult my, my mom, my actual <laughs> biological father, my biological siblings, and then the two other men she's been married to and all of the yeah. other step or half like siblings that I have through that. Um, she was a baby making machine for this cult. Yeah, she had seven kids in 14 years by the age of 30. Yeah. And then now, now wow. she has eight, eight children total. Okay. Um, and and yeah. she just turned 50. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. And that was called. The, that so was that called, sums you know, that up. That was called going for the gold, uh, which you mentioned earlier in a military context, right? But in the mm. family and children of God, they're, they're actually. They're very pleased. They're, yeah, their doctrine was, right? forced polyamory and no birth control. So yep. you have basically as many mm-hmm. kids. There are some families that have like every color of the rainbow children with the same mom and all these different dads. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the, the children of God used religious prostitution or what they called flirty fishing or hooking for Jesus to bring both money and membership into the group. And then those babies Oof. were called Jesus babies. And they were all like, Oh, girl. Yeah. It's it's amazing to me how forward they are about all of this. It is not hidden or occult in nature. It is a doctrine. The women must produce. They have to welcome the uncles into the bed. The children are not, are not off limits. This is why the first line of uncultured is the first rule of a cult is you're never in a cult, right? Mm-hmm. It, it takes me two years after I've left the cult and changed my whole life to realize mm. like oh it was a cult right because like yeah. Cult, yeah. cult was the dirtiest word in our world right like we mm-hmm. we were mm-hmm. definitely not a cult we knew we were accused of being a cult and we had all of the reasons that we could tell you why we weren't a cult yeah. which is the exact same thing you know military people do to you if you suggest that maybe there are some some cultic practices they will immediately go oh my god we're not a cult. Here's X, Y, Z reasons. Well, I mean, they, and they took the care to even create indoctrinating books to get the children ready, you know, let your uncle touch you, whatever. I forgot, because you can get raped outside of here, but you can never get raped inside of here because it's all God's love. That was exactly it, right? And we had these kids' comics, like one called Heaven's Girl, and there's literally a scene where she is being gang raped and she God. is witnessing to the men and converting them to God while they're raping her. And so in the I'm end, so it's sorry. supposed to be this beautiful thing. And these were our bedtime stories. My dad, my stepfather is the one illustrating these comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, now it's unbelievable. Now, of course, they like to say they didn't know any of it. They didn't know what was going on. It was just a few bad apples. And I always oh, okay. to, like these comics. Like everyone was reading these comics. Wow. I'd like to see some of those. Um, but definitely the idea, you know, I've been grappling with this because my abusers were females off topic, uh, but uh, three different people. But And it was a sex slavery situation too. Tap, 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 time to go, you know. But um, when I think about religion, men wrote these books. Men concocted a lot of these ideas and it's working well for them, you know. Like, especially with children of God, it's just show me a church, any cult or religion that didn't follow a doctrine of a male. 
And that works very well. Of course, they work sex into it. Of course, they're going to make sure they get serviced. And women can do it, too. I just want to add. But it's just, um, it's sad, uh, the relationship between religion and sex, especially when it's an indoctrinated thing. Because, again, robbing you of your childhood, of natural development, you don't understand, I didn't, even how to flirt with someone just to get to know a man. I had to learn all of that in my 20s, trying to understand how to, you know, interact with the opposite sex in a natural manner, not, uh, well, I'm supposed to do this now, you know? No, you don't have to. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I realized I did not have a, a non-toxic relationship with a non-manipulative man until I right. was 25. And right. I think I'm lucky that I was that young. It is. It's it's so deep into the core. And to kind of go back to what you said about like these organizations are built by men mm. that built them to keep themselves in power. Yeah, there's this quote, the system isn't broken. It's working as designed. I think brings us back full circle to like the good uncles in the army. And like, you know, yeah. the army is one of these systems that is built for men. It's the ultimate boys club. It's the ultimate place you can go to like prove your masculinity and, and be worshipped by the world. And right. it's not surprising that it becomes this misogynist playground with mm -hmm. sexual crimes just endemic. You know, we, we literally say that rape is just a cost of, of wearing the uniform for women. That is and rough. That's what needs to change. The Frankie Files, Cults, Mind Control, and Sexuality in Society by Frankie Tease. Propaganda is strong when everyone pounces on you with groupthink. So if a woman speaks out, she's a dyke. Oh, yep. you, you, you dyke, you, you know, you don't even like men. Well, wait a minute, you know, it shouldn't be a shunning to say this makes me uncomfortable. And that is when you come in right back to the systems working as it should. Men want to stay in power. They don't, it's been a hundred years since we have been able to go to school. Yes, exactly. And it's only been a hundred years we've been allowed to serve in the military at all, right? Oh, 100? Okay, okay. Uh, it's like 101 or something at this point. Okay. But that's what I really try to show in Uncultured or what was kind of the power of it was exactly what you said, right? When a woman tries to speak out, they immediately just try to demonize her, make her uncredible, all of yeah. these things. And that's why we don't have very many of these just like raw open tellings of right. what we go through in our service. And in my case, I, right. Like coming back to that five, five, 15 minute mile, right. Like it's hard <laughs> for yes. them to accuse me of being a bad soldier. I played mm. boys games and I got all the little blingy things. And so and you're a badass. And I still, you know, as I say, like, Generally. I'm, I'm very proud of being one of the first women in deliberate ground combat and doing those patrols. And I also want to have the after action mm. review with the nation about yeah. why I was warned to watch my back against my fellow soldiers. Right. 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 Like, like both of those things exist in our experience. Right. And by the way, that was an amazing team that I was on and I loved the experience. But I was still being sent out untrained, unprotected, mm. and being told that my brothers in arms might gang rape me out on the objective. That that's the experience that we need to talk about and we need to deal with. And mm. I think holding those comparisons, you know, people accuse me of being biased. And of course, I come to the army as a cult survivor. So of course right. that's what I see. But I think, you know, what I want America to see is that as proud Americans, we should all wish that there were fewer similarities between a sex cult that trafficked children and the U.S. Army. It's like, no, you can be both strong and feminine. It's okay. I do a lot of speeches where I'm wearing a, like, pink dress yeah. that I crocheted myself mm. with a combat badge that I earned myself. Nice. Um, and that's actually one of the things I get told all the time. It's like, oh, well, you don't look like a veteran, which is People. very much a, it's a kind of microaggression <laughs> called an invalidation, a microaggression. Yes. And it's yes. like, but it's so interesting because America does have that perception of a woman yes. veteran is a, a butch lesbian, to, to just say it frankly. Um, and yeah. of course, there yeah. are some that are, and 
there are it's your choice you know yeah yeah, and there are it's your choice to be like me that look like Barbie and wear four inch heels all the time. And like all, all the ways to be a woman are valid and all the ways to be a woman soldier are valid. Hello, be all that you can be. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in programming, right? <laughs> Let's swap it out. Yeah. Um, you also, in the book, you touch on victim shaming, which we've been talking about um, that, I've been really diving deep into this because much of my abuse and programming was sexual and in the call. Um, victim shaming that society does enables lack of accountability for the abuser. It's much more convenient. And the same thing why a person who got out of a cult who was an adult in a cult gets more attention in the news than a child. It's too uncomfortable for society to wrap their head around someone being an indentured sex slave as a youth. It's very uncomfortable. It makes them realize uh, this is in your backyard. This is in, this is your neighbor. This is happening when you go to the grocery store and you see 10 people dressed to like in a cult, this could be happening to them. And it makes them uncomfortable. Well, this is part of what we have to fight against, but it, the victim shaming is such a strong propaganda. I've been really diving into that, trying to understand it. And maybe with your organizational psychology, you can make a comment on that. I mean, I will definitely say the victim shaming is strong. Like I thought when I said I was born in a sex cult, people would understand that I did not sign up for that. <laughs> but people in, in weird follow on questions afterwards, like it, but I do think, again, sort of the power of my story is it's very clear that I did not sign up for any of this. You know, I left right. when I was 15. My right. mother did not sign up for any of this. Right. And this is like how you're brought in and kept in. And it's yes. interesting, too, on the side of victim shaming that people you know, nobody asked me this because I left when I was 15, but many, many of my peers don't get out well into their teens or 20s. People have this perception that like, oh, if, quote, if it was so bad, why didn't you leave when you were 18? Why didn't you move to Cambodia when you were 18 with nothing? Mm. You know, like, like mm. you don't just all of a sudden become a legal adult and one, even know that you're in a cult, right? Mm. And know how to get away or know how to do any of that. You know, for my mom, it takes her till she's literally 39 years old right. to finally be able to grab all her children and leave. Coercion, coercive sex is very underreported. Society doesn't seem to understand not all rape happens in a van with a gun. It's like, no, it's people you know that convince you they deserve this in religion especially, and religion and fear is held over your head. You have to cooperate. There's no choice. Where would I go? It's ironic. In your case, they even trained you to what to do in case you were raided. They had walls ready to defend what was going on. So, yes, I, I mean, people just don't get it, and it's like this is an uphill battle. We're fighting on that. Yes. And to your point, right, people think that if you see them walking around in the grocery store, that means they're free. And that means mm. they have choice. And I, you know, I oh, was contrary. in a, a cross country drive six months ago, and I saw all of these little girls in the long skirts with the long hair, mm -hmm. smiling Jesus's love at me. And God. it was so it, it, it is happening. Like you said, it's in your backyard. Um, yes. And I actually think I didn't do this then, but I've since learned, right? One of the most powerful things people can do if you're able to get close to one of those children is just tell them like one of these days you'll be able to get away and there are good people outside, right? Because okay. that's one of the things that they program you with when you're a child is that everyone in the outside world is terrible. And I try to show this in my high school chapters where like, it's all I've ever wanted is to go to school. But I'm right. also terrified. Most people are good, not yeah. evil, right? Yeah, that's one of the things I love and like I plan to do in the future when I see cult kids, good. right? It's just like you can't tell them anything in the moment that their parents are not going to dissect for them. 
and, yeah. and flip around other than like one day when you get free, there are good people out there. Well, how high is your IQ, Daniela? Oh, I've never tested it. <laughs> well, it's pretty high because, I mean, what stood out too is you articulated really well. And this happened for me later in my experience. Cracks begin to appear. You start to question the doctrine that enables such pain. You start to wonder why, you know, um, Waco, why are we acting so similar? Oh, well, wait, we're not a cult, but you're questioning the similarities. You're starting to see what's really going on and you had to wait basically until you could get away. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I do think... So I don't know what my IQ is, but I do say, like, I was born an atheist. At least yeah. at the age of six, I knew I was wow. done with God. And I don't know what it is about me, but I am one of those people that doesn't accept and the mm -hmm. hoax and the prods. And even I when think I it's the myself, amygdala. <laughs> yeah, and even when I put myself into the army by my own choice, right, I still yeah. couldn't just accept and go along with things. And I very much think that's part of what got me out early well uh, just to wrap up i know we're kind of going over time but it's been wonderful um what is organizational psychology about for you what motivates you to take that direction yes yeah, so organizational psychology is just the scientific study of why people do what they do in groups kind of easiest way to okay. explain that group dynamics okay. and i found this program at harvard mm -hmm. extension school that was going to allow me to sort of build my own course ish. Wonderful. And I really wanted to study cults and toxic groups and women in the military. And mm -hmm. after January 6th, I, st I started studying a lot more about directly the mm -hmm. process of extremism and radicalization and similarities between why people join cults, terrorist groups, or militaries or any of these kind of total control organizations. Wow. Um, but for Great. most people, organizational psychology is they're the consultants that are going to come in and help you just motivate people, do different work dynamic things. Mm -hmm. Which um, you do too, I, right? You do too? I, I do. I do. I just it's fabulous. more on the side of like, when you go people first, <laughs> there's a cult yeah. side to that, right? So so when you go people first, it's great. It's much better than business and profit first. Right. But like what safeguards are you going to put in place to mm -hmm. sort of keep this from going off the rails, right? Children of God started off as love, faith, and Jesus and ended Wait. as religious prostitution, pedophilia, and the, the apocalypse. Right. And it's there's a there's a point in there that your organization starts to shift. And I've seen it with nonprofits and right. I've seen it with militaries. And I I am intrigued by I think this concept that all groups have more and more similarities yeah. than differences. And so right. your lovely workplace, your amazing family, your wonderful church is much less far away from being a toxic cult than anyone ever thinks it is. It, yeah. One hair's breadth away from turning into David Koresh. Exactly. Um, so, so basically, it gives me great pleasure to see a cult survivor able to make money because a lot of times we struggle to be around people. And, you know, when people hurt you, so I applaud you. I applaud your book. The book was wonderful. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us here today. And uh, if you would like to give any last thoughts uh, where people can find you and things to look into that you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, best place to find me is on Twitter, Daniela M. Young, my friend, the most active cult videos on TikTok. Book is already available for pre-order wherever you buy books. Uncultured by Daniela Mestinek Young. Look out for more stuff by me because I'm gonna be the Taylor Swift of the literary world. And you, you're writing nonfiction, right? I'm doing another nonfiction book, but I'm also okay. working on a few fiction projects too. Wow, I um, can't wait. And I would say finally, you know, the, the one thing I want people to take from this book isn't actually like me calling the army a cult or anything, it's just, the more you sit and think about the dynamics of whatever groups you're in, the better off you're going to be.
If comparing it to a sex cult helps you see some things, great. Well, your voice is strong. Your voice is loud. It's a pleasure to be in this space with you. So I'm so pleased to have you, a veteran and cult survivor, on my show. Everybody give it up for Daniela M. Young. Thank you for talking with us, Daniela. Thank you, ma'am. The Frankie Fox.